We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you! When Greta Thunberg drew national attention for her comments at the UN in the summer of 2019, some praised her performance as a stinging rebuke to the rich and powerful for failing to put the survival of the planet above their own needs. At just 16 years old, our next guest is already changing the world. Pick for the 2019. She became the biggest voice on the biggest issue facing the planet. Others saw the exploitation of a young woman with emotional problems for propagandistic ends. A mentally ill Swedish child who is being exploited by her parents and by the international How dare left. You. But there's no question that Thunberg's style of environmentalism, strident, urgent, and critical of global capitalism, has gained a strong foothold in contemporary politics. A 2019 paper from the journal Biosciences, co signed by more than 11,000 scientists, asserted that planet Earth's population must be stabilized and ideally gradually reduced, and some politicians have questioned the morality of having children at all. There's scientific consensus that the lives of children are going to be very difficult, and it does lead, I think, young people to have a legitimate question, you know, should is it okay to still have children? Educating everyone on the need to curb population growth seems a reasonable campaign to enact. Would you be courageous enough to discuss this issue and make it a key feature of a plan to address climate catastrophe? Well, well I think the answer is yes. Fears of overpopulation and ecological disaster are also beginning to manifest on the far right, mixed in with an anti-immigrant animus. The logic was expressed in its most dramatic and twisted form in the 2019 manifestos of mass shooters in both New Zealand and Texas. If we can get rid of enough people, he wrote, then our way of life can become more sustainable. Whether contemporary proponents of these ideas know it or not, they are all intellectual heirs of the misguided 18th century thinker Robert Thomas Malthus, who believed that when human population increased, famine and environmental destruction would ensue. Malthus argued that population would always outstrip food supply because population would grow at exponential rates, whereas food supply could only grow at what he called arithmetic rates. Reason science correspondent Ron Bailey is the author of the 2015 book End of Doom. He didn't recognize that, in fact, crops and livestock are also populations, that they can also be exponentially increased at the same time as a human population was. And that's exactly what happened. Basically, the Malthusian prescription turns out to be completely wrong. In the contemporary world, Malthusianism was most famously expressed through the work of ecologist Paul Ehrlich, especially in his 1968 book, The Population Bomb. The only hope that there is is that we will be able, at least in the United States, through the political process, to get a government that's courageous enough to say, look, we're overpopulated and we have to have population control and start moving in that direction. He predicted that through the 1970s and 80s, hundreds of millions would starve to death. He compared humanity to a cancer, writing that we must shift our efforts from treatment of the symptoms to the cutting out of the cancer. Ehrlich, who still holds an endowed professorship at Stanford, didn't respond to our interview request. His proposed solutions included taxing diapers, subsidizing vasectomies, and even spiking food aid and water supplies with sterilizing drugs, and then holding a lottery for access to the antidote. Similarly, ecologist Garrett Hardin in 1968 compared humanity to overbreeding cattle, writing that the freedom to breed is intolerable. The only way to make this system work is to have the family be willing to give up one of its former freedoms, namely the freedom to determine how many children it was going to have. Ehrlich would turn out to be as wrong-headed as Malthus. Over the next half century, calories available per capita steadily increased in just about every region of the world, thanks largely to improved agricultural techniques and technology. Humans were not only consumers, we're also producers. We're able to create new things, to use resources in better and better ways over time. Human creativity can overcome the problems that Malthusians think that we're going to be suffering from overconsumption. We're using fewer and fewer resources to get more and more value over time. And yet world hunger is yet to be eradicated, with the UN reporting that about 10% of the global population is undernourished. And perhaps it's true that past trends don't predict the future. Well, that's a lot of people. How are we going to feed them all? Karen Pitts, who is a member of the Sierra Club and ran a Northern California subcommittee on population growth, is concerned that the world won't be able to accommodate a population that's expected to peak at 11 billion by 2100. She became interested in the topic after a trip to China in 1996. As you flew over the country, 
Every space was taken up by houses and housing. They are overpopulated. Whether or not they produce enough food is a big question, and we really can't take the risk of being wrong. While it's true that farmers will have to become 70% more efficient over the next 30 years to feed the growing population, the technology already exists to accomplish that goal. If all farmers were as efficient as U.S. corn growers, the world could feed 10 billion people today on half as much land. And as humanity continues moving into cities, the environment will likely be better protected, Bailey points out, because this allows for the restoration of forests and other ecosystems on the land migrants leave behind. Something like 90% of people will be living in cities by the end of the century. If that is the case, there'll be less than 2 billion people living on the landscape which means that there'll be far more scope for forests to return, for biodiversity to flourish, and we'll be using a lot less resources over that time. But today's Malthusians are most concerned about the disruptive effects of climate change. Citing global warming, documentarian David Attenborough described humanity as a plague upon the earth. I can't think of a single problem that wouldn't be easier to solve if there were less people. And the biosciences paper, signed by 11,000 scientists, projects total societal collapse if population isn't managed properly. We scientists have a moral obligation to clearly warn humanity of any catastrophic threat. It is more severe than anticipated, threatening natural ecosystems and the fate of humanity. There's a catastrophizing apocalyptic undercurrent. Ted Nordhaus, who is a founder of the Breakthrough Institute, which advocates technological solutions to environmental problems, believes the environmental movement has long been hindered by its anti-growth paradigm. Conventional environmental ideology posits human development and environmental protection oppositionally, and I have exactly the opposite view. Nordhaus says that the most effective way to deal with climate change is by promoting policies that accelerate economic growth. If you're really serious about accelerating the decline of fertility rates and the peak and stabilization of global population, you need to accelerate economic development for certainly probably three or four billion people over the next three or four decades. Most of today's environmentalists don't openly advocate for the draconian population control measures pushed by Ehrlich and other Malthusians in the 1970s. Karen Pitt says she just wants more sex education and greater access to birth control in the developing world, pointing to a project she participated in with Tanzania's local population. I have introduced contraception. We put tablets over there that they could use plus being able to administer family planning. And the contraception rate went from about 25% to over 54%, surprisingly easy. Those women wanted family planning. Funding greater access to birth control and education for women in developing countries was also a recommendation of the biosciences paper. And it's a policy agenda of the UN and leading NGOs like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Nordhaus says such measures can help at the margins, but ultimately miss the big picture, which is that as wealth increases, fertility rates naturally fall as families invest more resources in fewer children. The real drivers of long-term fertility decline and population stabilization around the world are just kind of garden variety economic development, which a lot of the same people signing those documents are actually saying is the problem. The biosciences paper argues that economic growth is driving overconsumption of resources and says our goals need to shift from GDP growth and the pursuit of affluence towards sustaining ecosystems. As soon as we find new ways to do it, our consumption increases. That's the problem. Pitts is right that people in wealthier societies tend to consume resources and generate greenhouse gases at rates that are orders of magnitude higher than those in the third world. But Nordhaus points out that when poor societies become wealthy, there are more people positioned to help solve environmental problems in the only way that really works, with new technology. Environmental discourse has been overly focused on consumption. Technology is one of the key things that mediates the relationship between affluence and consumption and impacts. Wealthier, more developed societies are both better positioned to adapt to problems like climate change and climate impacts. A category five hurricane creates a lot more devastation and a lot more loss of life and human impact in a poor society than in a rich society. They're also better positioned to develop and deploy new technology. 
most of the success we've had in deploying nuclear or other clean energy technologies is actually in contexts where energy demand is growing quickly. And so Nordhaus advocates for greater reliance on clean, abundant energy like nuclear power to fuel advanced economies towards possibly innovating even lower impact alternatives. But the third world may still need to rely on traditional fossil fuels on its path to prosperity. Certainly over the next three or four decades, a lot of development, particularly in poor countries, is still going to be fossil based. But it could be natural gas and not coal. Or in Africa, for instance, just there's huge hydro capacity in projections of sort of where populations are going to stabilize or is really when you get down to the bottom of it is just ultimately a question of how rapidly Africa develops economically. Nordhaus says that climate change will likely continue to present challenges for governments, individuals, and societies in the coming decades, but that it's better to conceive the problem not as an asteroid hurtling towards Earth, dooming us to extinction unless we thwart it, but as a global case of diabetes. Diabetes when it's treated, is manageable. It depends on what we do. And that's not just about cutting carbon emissions. It's also development makes us more resilient to climate extremes of all sorts. Malthus wasn't completely wrong about the tendency of humans to deplete resources, says Bailey, but he failed to see that new ways of organizing society would ameliorate the problem. Up until about two centuries ago, Robert Thomas Malthus was about right, is that in fact, population was regulated by food supply and something changed. The world understood the role of property rights, for example, the rule of law, and this dramatically changed the incentive structures that people had. Activists like Naomi Klein who argued their economic system is at war with their climate system. She wants to replace it with some sort of communitarian socialism. I would suggest to you that doing that would exactly bring back the Malthusian conditions that we used to live in. The thing that we need to do is proceed to produce more wealth, more technology in order to ameliorate and overcome the problems that climate change is going to cause. Her prescription is exactly the opposite of what needs to be done. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? That's the kind of claim that it doesn't actually enlighten at all. It doesn't actually tell us anything about the real choices uh, we're faced with. What sorts of social and political and economic arrangements we ought to aspire to, you know, for a planet that is pretty soon going to be nine or 10 billion people. What it's not is going to be agrarian, traditional economies. With 10 billion people, if you ever tried to actually like have everybody live that way, we would just cut down every forest in the world and then we would collapse. This is not real. These are fantasies. She's going to go back to Copenhagen and live a very righteous life as an international environmental celebrity in a wealthy city surrounded by extraordinary modern infrastructure, most of which was built with fossil fuels. That's Greta Thunberg's future, and I would like that future for everybody else on the planet. <laughs>